Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's so great to see so many of you here. Um, particularly after a few years of doing this online, it's really lovely to feel a full lecture theatre uh, once again. So, huge welcome to our induction event today um, and a big welcome to the York Graduate Research School. So, just a brief bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, we're not expecting any fire alarms at this point in time. So, if you do hear an alarm, please make uh, an exit to your nearest fire exits. There's two at the top and also the way through the ground floor would be great. Um, the running of today's event will uh, take the form of an introduction from Professor Kate Arnold. We will then be giving you some practical advice and tips on how to get started with your research degrees. We will be hearing from some current postgraduate researchers about some of their insights and, and things that they've found really enjoyable and useful here at the University of York. And at the end of it, towards the end of the event, we'll have the opportunity to introduce you to some of our professional support staff colleagues, and you can ask them any questions that you might have about getting started with your degrees here at York. After that, we will be welcoming you through to the atrium to have some coffee and some cake and also to meet one another. So please do take the opportunity to, to chat to one another um, and to meet people from outside of your department. That is the beauty of being here all in the room together. So um, without further ado, I'm really thrilled to introduce to you Professor Kate Arnold, Dean of the York Graduate Research School. Thank you very much. Thanks, Francina and team. Oh, it's wonderful to see you all here today, and thank you for joining us. So, uh, a warm welcome to the University of York. Um, as Francina said, I'm Kate Arnold. I'm Dean of York Graduate Research School. And it's a really great honour and privilege to welcome you all here today into the what I like to think of as the inner circle of York Graduate Research School. So all of you are here today because you have made the, the wise decision to embark on a, a postgraduate research degree. And also because we at the university have spotted potential in you, in you that potential to create new knowledge and to, to do great things. And so this is a, a really exciting uh, uh, start of a, a new era, I guess, in, in, your, uh, in your lives. So this afternoon, we are going to meet uh, the team and uh, introduce you to the resources and all the support uh, that we have at the University of York to make sure that you achieve success uh, while you're with us. So. so, what does it mean to be a member of the University of York? Well. We are a very values-driven institution, and we have this big commitment to being a university for the public good. And that infuses everything that, that we do. It's not just what we do, what we research, um, it's how we do our research, um, and who we work with and who we share our research with. So we are very driven by uh, being this, these curiosity driven and action orientated is kind of the, the tagline there. Um, and what it means is, I mean, I suspect that you, like me, we're all researchers here, and I suspect all of you, like me, were, were always that kid that was asking why. You are always wanting to know why and curious. And we are so lucky. You are now going to spend the next few years professionally being that kid asking why. And that's a fantastic position to be in. So uh, you've got to do this for, uh, for three or so years. And you'll also be the ones that are coming up with solutions, with actions, with new and unique perspectives. So whether you're studying, I don't know, uh, medieval art or literature, all the way through to um, the genes that cause cancer, you are going to be coming up with uh, new, new knowledge. So, in 2022, uh, I think it was, uh, the University of York uh, went through a, a big national exercise to evaluate the research that we do here. It's called the REF, um, and I won't go into the details, but we scored 10th in the UK for the research that we do here. And that's phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal, particularly for a, for a university of our size. But that was, would not be possible without our PGR community. 
So ARC-PGR community is vital to the research endeavours that, that we have here, uh, that we uh, produce here at York. So postgraduate research at York. Um, let me give you a little flavour, a little insight into, into the importance of that, why you are so important to us uh, here at York. So who are you? You're a really diverse community. You come from all, all walks of life, all parts of the world, and you are here for very, you might have very different motivations for doing a PhD. Where are we doing research? Well, we're doing it all over the place. You'll be on campus, in departments, going out into schools. You might be doing it remotely. You might be doing field work. You, you're going to be doing it independently, collectively, collaboratively. And what? And I think that's really important, is you're going to be producing a unique contribution to knowledge and hopefully answering some big questions um, that are important to humanity. And it's important. I mean, I think if anything, over the last few years, we've realised without research, we as a, as, a, as a human race are nowhere. Research is really vital for the success of our planet. And as I said, York, we're values driven. So we are, the way we do research is important. And there's lots of values there. And I'm just going to pick one set, which is our commitment to respecting the values of equality, diversity, and inclusivity. And that's really important, important to us. And we'll talk through a bit, bit more of that on, on some of the work that we're doing. So, as I said, York, 10th in the UK for our research. You're really important to us. And that's why when York put together its new research strategy, PGRs are absolutely at the heart of this. So we've got a number of commitments, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but I want to, I want to just flag a, a, few, a few bits uh, of, of, of points here. So one is, is that we have a commitment to you to make sure that we uh, facilitate innovation. So we want to make sure that you have access to the right people, the right kit, the right uh, ideas, the right research, the right tra training. So that's our, one of our commitments to you. As I said, we also want to diversify our PGR community. So we want to support people from all over the world, from all walks of life. We want to make sure that you are reflective of, of the wider population and that you're asking questions that are important to the rest of society. We also know that at the end of this PhD, most of you are probably wanting to go out into a career. Um, some of you, a small proportion of you, will end up as academics. Um, and the rest of you will go out and you, we want our brightest and our best. We want people like you who are curious and can do research to go out and be really successful in your future career in a whole range of sectors. So we have a commitment to make sure we, we get you ready for that. And finally, uh, one of the most important relationships uh, that you will have, and one thing that's so key to your success, is your supervisor, your supervisory team. And so we are working really hard to enhance the quality and the consistency of research supervision at the university. So that's some of the, the commitments that we've made as an institution to you. Um, and I just want to um, uh, flag, oh, no. Ooh, there we go. Look, I didn't practice this. Is one initiative, which is our Yorkshire Consortium for Equity and Doctoral Education, which is we're particularly supporting people from um, uh, ethnically minoritised group, and we provide um, some bespoke support for them uh, at five institutions across Yorkshire. So, what is YGRS, and how? What can we do for you? Well. We, we quite often ask ourselves, what is OIGRS? And I suppose it's a, it's a virtual wrapper or maybe a, a cosy blanket that goes around a whole bunch of services and sources of support for you. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that at this today. And I'm going to pick out a few um, things uh, on this one. Uh, this diagram. So as I said, we are very much working to support people from a variety of backgrounds and to create that community, make sure that you find your tribe, that you find the people that are going to support, support you. The other thing that I, we spend a lot of time uh, at the university, uh, uh, here at YGRS doing is PGR representation. So 
we want to make sure that PGR perspectives and voices are heard throughout the university, right from uh, PGR reps on university, uh, to, sorry, departmental committees, all the way through to Senate. So it's making sure that your voice is heard in, by decision makers at the university. Um, we also uh, we have oversight of all of your progression and assessment as well. So uh, we and you'll hear a bit more about uh, about that today um, as well. And you're going to hear more about some of the other areas that we work on. And I finally want to say we'll also tell you about lots of opportunities. So every fortnight you will be getting uh, a jolly message from me in a newsletter that tells you a whole bunch of um, information and opportunities, whether it be for jobs or training or networking. So you'll, you'll get that. And we've got our website, which is the main source of information for you. OK. So let me tell you a bit about the wider community. So just to give you some facts and figures so you get, get kind of a, 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 a feel for what, what you're joining, I suppose. So we have at the moment about 2,300 uh, PGRs. So most of those postgraduate researchers are doing PhDs, but they're also doing masters by research and also doing uh, MPhils. So compared with undergraduates, you're actually quite a small group, but you are the largest group of researchers on campus. And as I said, that makes you very um, important because of your numbers. Most of you are full-time. Some of you are, are, are part-time. Um, some of you are based on campus, and some of you are distance. So hello to anybody um, watching this again, um, because they're not here in the room with us today. About, about 40% of you come from overseas. So can I have a bit of a show of hands? Who's, who's come here from overseas? Excellent. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, this gentleman here, do you mind me asking where you've come from? Uh, I'm from Italy. Italy. Yeah. Welcome. Um, I know, I was going to try and say something in Italian. <laughs> Arrivederci. Um, <laughs> anyone from further afield than Italy? Yes, please. Canada, Canada uh, welcome. Um, anyone from further afield than Canada? Any from the Southern Hemisphere? Yes, hello. Where are you from? Colombia. Um, no, I was going to say bonjour, but that's right. You can tell I'm not a linguist. I'm a scientist by background. <laughs> we have a linguist on the team, so um, I'm sure she'll uh, be able to talk to you fluently. Welcome. So about 40% of you, of you from overseas. And I know, I, having been an international student myself, so I did a year of my degree in Germany, my undergraduate degree in Germany, and my PhD in Australia. So I know what a big commitment and a big disruption it is to come and work overseas. So yeah, fantastic. Welcome. Um, and also, we, you range in age. Uh, so between t about 20 and 70, most of you are uh, the average. On average, it's about 30. 30. So, and, and I say that to you because we also realise that that means that maybe some of the services and um, activities that are put on for undergraduates might not be something that, that appeals to you. You might want to go nightclubbing on a Tuesday evening. That's fine. That's fine. Um, but you might not. So we know that that's... Uh, that's important and we're aware of that. Okay, you're important. You also hold a really unique position on, uh, in our community. So as a PGR, you are a researcher and I, uh, we, our preference is that we call you postgraduate researcher or PhD researcher and so on. You're professional researchers, you're in training. You're also a student, and some of you uh, may be current staff members, or you will become staff members. So as a researcher, your main uh, contact and your support is probably going to be from your department, uh, particularly your supervisory or what's called your TAP panel, your thesis advisory panel. You are also a, a student. And that's where YGRS uh, particularly will get involved. So we, we provide the, really the expertise to support you um, on your PGR journey from induction here today um, through to when you graduate, when you get your award. 
And many of you will also, if you're not staff members, you will probably become staff members. So lots of you have a really important role as what we call a GTA, a graduate teaching assistant. And in that case, you'll probably liaise with your department about that, um, about getting contracts. Um, and also you will get, um, you might want to do training with the, the YLTA um, team who we'll probably hear about. So you have quite an, a unique and, and complex um, position in, in the university. You're on, embarking on an exciting journey. It's going to be fantastic. Of course, we have to, you know, it's very privileged, but of course you have some responsibilities. And I just want to, to pick out a few things um, that, that where we, we, we've got some expectations and you'll go into detail more about this um, in your own department. The first thing, your supervisor. Your supervisor is really key. Manage that relationship. There's a whole course you can do on managing your supervisory relationship. So make sure you go into those meetings, be prepared, make sure you've got the right questions and areas you want to discuss. So um, uh, my, my PGRs, for example, they always <laughs> send me an agenda beforehand. So really to keep me focused, um, and I love that um, because I know what we're going to be talking about and they've really thought about that meeting. Um, next thing. One day you will have to grow up and go out into the big wild world. So think about the, your professional development. So think about how you can improve the skills that you need to get your PhD, but also think in the future. You've got, you've got loads of courses and, and training opportunities available to you. So please take them and, and develop that pr um, professional development plan. And finally, doing a PhD um, in particular is tough. In the UK, about 2% of the population have a PhD. Um, so it's, it's a tough, you will have highs and you will have lows. So get to know your pe peers, find your people, find people with similar interests, they might not be in your department. There's all sorts of clubs that you can join through the union and the university. Start today with over cake, but actually I want you to actually just start right now. So look around you, is there someone that you don't know sat next to you? And I want you to take a moment and just say hello, introduce yourself and tell them your, who your, what your department is. To do that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to finish. I am going to finish now. Well done. You've met a new somebody new, um, and uh, you can follow up over coffee and cake later. So it wouldn't be an academic uh, lecture or a presentation without a quote. So we've got lots of educated people in the room here. Can anyone identify this quote? Yes! <laughs> Always cite your sources. So yes, uh, yes, this is a, 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 that famous, uh, famous poet, Shakira. So yes, from Try, uh, Try Everything, which I think is a song, which I think is a good mantra for doing a PhD. Birds, birds don't just fly, they fall down and get up. Nobody learns without getting it wrong. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I just want to finish by saying, in creating new knowledge, um, you're going to go, you're, you're starting this journey. There is no Google map for the journey that you're going on, because um, you're going to create new knowledge. You will go down blind alleyways, you will make mistakes, you will fall down. And this is normal. It's my job here to stay, say, that is normal. Uh, you will, we will go through that process, trust in that process, and trust that, that you have a, a support team around you. You have your supervisors, you have your department. You've got a whole bunch of lovely people that you're going to meet now. We've got uh, the team that's going to support you across YGRS. So we've got your back. Um, we, we're here to support you, and I wish you every success uh, in your PGR journey. Thank you very much. Well, how to follow up with the Shakira quote, hey? <laughs> no pressure. Right, why Jarrah's showcase? Before I start, I would like to very much welcome you again and thank you for choosing York. This is a fantastic place, and I'm not just saying this, you will learn that yourself. So, my name is Dr. Dominika Butler, and I'm from Building Research and Innovation Capacity Team, short BRIC. You will learn a little bit about us too, but today I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we can support you in your journey or throughout your journey, because right now 
you are at exactly the same point, right? You are starting, this is the very beginning. Are you excited, motivated? You want to make a difference, right? Yes, <laughs> I hope so. So at this point, you are very much at the starting line. But after you leave this room today, you're gonna go off and start doing completely different things. Each of you will work on a different project, right? Everybody will discover something amazing. And I promise you that, you will. Whether it's something like you like to discover or something completely unexpected, you will discover things. Embrace research and science and whatever different disciplines you might be at. So, the way that we can support you, and Kate already alluded to it quite a bit, if you look at my lovely slide, the bright blue is your supervisor, your department, and your thesis advisor, advisory panel. But there's also somebody very important there. Can you spot this? Your graduate administrator from your department. Learn who those people are, because they are fantastic and they know everything. They do know everything. So at any point, when you feel a little bit lost, speak to them. And apologies for those graduates that uh, graduate administrator who are thinking now, oh, thanks for that. We're going to have a thousand of emails. <laughs> That's going to be fine. But being York PGR also means you get access to everything else. You see all those white blocks? Exciting, right? So your graduate research school, as Kate told you just now, there's plenty of support available, available for you. And there will be PGRA team, so your postgraduate research administration. But there's also going to be the YC, the Dean Kate herself, but also my team, which is the BRIC team. And BRIC, there's something quite spectacular here. And I'm hoping I'm not advertising us too much, because I'll get told off. But we are the bridge between us and plenty of other support teams at the university. And this university is quite amazing because we've got all the different specialist teams. And you'll see there's not just one, there's plenty. And all of these are able to support you with different things. So at the moment, you might think, well, I don't really know what those people do. And that's fine. You will learn along the way. And you will learn pretty fast because you will have plenty of questions. I promise you that. So today, I'm going to show you a little bit about how to find out what's out there for you. You'll see I've got quite a few different links into the slides. And one of them is YGRS website. When you click on my magic link, you will see it will take you right to YGRS. And there's that lovely tab here, which says information for new PGR. That's you, OK? If at any point you forget all about what I told you today, all you need to remember is like, who am I? Oh, I'm a new PGR. I'm just going to search for this. And that takes you directly to this website. And have a look. You've got a lot of different options on the side. But what's important is this starting at York. Have you been looking at this website already? Show of hands if you have. Ooh, well done. To those of you who haven't, that's your homework, please. So please explore what there is, what we already collated for you. So things to do first. And you will notice there's a lovely list. Have you been working through it? If you haven't, that's all fine. No other pressure. You've got quite a bit of time to do it. But there's plenty of different things that you can do. And make sure that you are quite familiar of what's on this website. Because if you are, then any questions you might have, you will know that there was a tab to talk about in your first year, right? That's 12 months from now. However, however, time flies. Don't delay things. If there are things that you can do now, please do them. You'll see there's some training that's recommended that you do soon. And I mean soon, you know, like put it in your calendar, right? Don't forget about this. You can develop your skills, and there's different options for that, doing that. But also, if you then think about, OK, well, I want specific support in different areas. So for example, if it's something to do with health and well-being, you click on that link at the bottom, and it will take you to pages on that too. Please explore the website today. OK, that's your homework. That's your first part of the homework. How exciting is this, hey? Eh? You'll have a little bit more afterwards.
But what I would like to show you as well is something that's very important if you forget how to get into those things. Remember, if you are logging in to your university account from any university computer, it will take you directly to university website. And there's the search box right at the top, and you can always search for that website. You're going to be fine finding it. It's going to be all right. Tab it, bookmark it, whatever it is that you need to do. There is something that I needed to mention also, because today we've mentioned quite a few teams, right? I had all those white tiles, and you think, oh, actually, I don't know what they do. That's fine. But we prepared something for you, which is like the blueprint of a new building. We prepared some blue slides, so you will know that actually what you need to know about certain teams. You can just quickly have a glance, and there are different teams. Some of them will be on the panel later, so you'll hear from them. But you'll see each of the slides is actually information about a team, and then you can find out what do they do. Just a quick glance, it's like, oh, where do I ask this question? Do I go to this people, these people, or that team? And then a couple of points that you might consider doing sometime soon. So have a look at these as well. Again, you don't have to know it all straight away, but it might be useful. And if in doubt, email YGRS or Brick team. We are absolutely happy to, to give you some um, support on that. There's one thing I wanted to mention. Towards the end, you can see accessing docs and files. We are a Google university, essentially. So we quite often use Google documents, Google Sheets, Google spreadsheets, all sorts of things, Google. And the way we share resources with you is we send you the links, information. If you are not logged in with your university username and password, you'll get uh -uh. So please try and remember to be logged in into your browser. Can you see where I'm pointing with the mouse just here? Make sure that you are logged in with your Google University email address, OK? And then you get access to everything. If you forget, it might log you out. Simple, but hopefully you'll not um, forget that. And a couple of this um, last important bits, I would say, is how will you hear from us, from the YGRS and the wider teams? Kate mentioned YGRS newsletter. This is something that lands in your inbox, conveniently, right? Every two weeks. This is something that you open and read, OK? Make sure you do that. Don't ignore it, because the information in the YGRS newsletter it might be about something that's exciting, that's new, that's coming. Make sure you read this. If you wanted to have a quick sneaky peek at the one that was posted recently, you follow the link and it will take you to newsletters and you can open the very current one and you'll see what was talked about. I'm going to hide it. You're not going to see it right now, right? There's also YGRS blog. This is also a very nice resource for you. When there's something really exciting coming up or something completely new, we talk about it here. Keep an eye on this. Maybe bookmark it too. And like I mentioned before, your departmental graduate administrators, any emails from them, you do what? You read. And you read it twice. Okay? If there's something that they mentioned, do it. You do it there and now whenever it's needed, okay? Don't forget that. And another last sort of way of hearing from us, we are on Twitter, or X, if anybody uses X. There we go. That sounds really wrong, right? Um, we are at Brick on the score York. Why, Jairus, I don't think it's on it, so we will be sharing quite a lot of different um, options of what's happening with you. And that brings me to my last bit of homework for you. Are you excited? Phones out. You can scan it and access the doc. This is a things to do sometime soon because we put like lovely little list of options of different things that you can do. You don't have to do it all today, but please have a look and then open your magic Google calendar and plan things in it. If you just say, oh, I'll do it tomorrow, not going to happen, right? So that was my last slide. So what's your homework for today? Explore YGRS website, find out what's on it, and second, look at the list and make sure that you plan some of those activities because they are needed. Thank you very much. So um, 
The next section of today's event is going to give you a really practical few tips and bits of advice around getting started with your research degree. So my name is Francina Clayton. I'm also a part of the BRIC team, so the Building Research and Innovation Capacity team. And I just want to start by asking the question that I'm guessing many of you in the room are also wondering. How do you know where to start? If you are anything like I was, a number of years ago when I started my PhD, probably far too long ago for me to remember when, um, I really do remember like it was yesterday, this feeling of walking into our shared office, seeing everybody there typing away, working at their desks, and literally not knowing what on earth to start with. So if there are any of you feeling that way at this point in time, I'm hopefully going to leave you with a few practical things that you can go away and get started with. Hopefully in a memorable way, these will circle around three main points. So the first is about finding your purpose. The second is about investing some time in some planning. And the final point is around reaching out to other people and keeping yourself involved and connected with others throughout your degree. So we'll start with purpose. Many of you will maybe think about well, what's the purpose of me being here? You know, why am I doing a research degree? From a very formal perspective, we might think of a research degree about providing some significant contribution to knowledge. And that may well be what's driven you here. That might be your purpose. Um, but I'm going to hedge a bet that maybe that you have your own individual, unique motivation for being here. What's brought you here today? What's made you choose to do a PhD or a research degree? What has brought you to choose York? to do your research. It might be that you really want to wear this remarkable floppy hat at your graduation in a few years' time. It might be that you, as I say, really want to extend knowledge in a particular area. It might be that you have really strong desires about improving and um, delivering on improving the experience for people in the wider world. I really think that a little bit of time spent now thinking about what your purpose is, what's going to drive you, is good is time well invested and it will help you stay motivated and on track when those challenging times might arise. So my second point was about planning. So I myself am a, nat a really avid planner, a bit of a planning nerd. I love a good spreadsheet and a Gantt chart is just my probably one of my favorite things to do. I shouldn't really admit that in public. Um, not everybody is a natural planner. And it's easy for me to say, I think you should do a bit of planning. And I really do strongly think, even if you invest a little bit in time, carving out a bit of a roadmap for what your PhD might look like over the next few years, again, is really time well invested. I like the metaphor of your PhD being a little bit like taking a road trip. So much like taking a road trip, you set out knowing where your, your destination is going to be. But of course, there are things that happen along the way that you can't predict. So as Kate mentioned, research almost always takes unexpected turns. I'd be really surprised if you got to the end of your research degrees and hadn't encountered some unanticipated issue. So acknowledging that and feeling comfortable with that, recognizing that setbacks are also part of that research process as well. So a little bit of planning, but also being comfortable and agile to respond to those challenges as and when they arise. In terms of a practical suggestion, I would recommend getting to understand what sort of milestones will help you know that you're on track. So these can be quite, quite specific to your department. So it might be worth having a chat with your supervisor about this, maybe also having a look at your department handbooks around those milestones that you would hope to reach and when they might happen for you. Our team can really help you in terms of developing your time and your project management skills. That's certainly something we can, we can help you with. Um, but in terms of today, I would say a really nice um, takeaway practical habit that you might be able to get started with is about setting a daily, a weekly, and a monthly goal. Ideally, just make it one. That will make it hopefully more achievable. And that's really key to developing a habit. You want it to give you that reward, and you want to keep trying at it. So keeping that record of your achievements and keeping a record of it will hopefully then allow you to look back and see the progress that you've made, which I can recognize is sometimes difficult in the, in the PhD journey, feeling like you're getting somewhere. And my final point is about people. So really important, you're not on your own through this process. And we really encourage you to ask for guidance and support, reach out to your supervisor, reach out to your thesis advisory panel, people in your department, and your peers. 
They're there to help you. We're also people in the room that are able to help you as well. So do engage with others and ask for that guidance and support as you need it. Importantly, engage with other researchers and, and participate in communities that exist. And if they don't exist, feel empowered to maybe create some communities uh, that, that suit your needs. So yeah, making time for your hobbies and your interests, your friends and your family, again, will keep you as a person recharged and rested and productive. We know that we're all more productive when we take breaks and speak to others and get involved with things at a community level. So I'm going to hand over to um, Grant Denkinson now from the Open Door team. And Grant's going to continue along the theme of creating communities and the importance of taking care of yourself. Thank you. So um, I'm Grant Denkinson. I work with the Open Door team. Um, some of you who have been here before would know Open Door is the central university well-being, taking care of difficult emotional things, someone to talk to. That's why we call it Open Door, because we're very broad. This is different than some of the other things, is we're not giving you a lot of things to remember, other than there are people to talk to, there are people to talk to who you will create your own networks, but also there are people to talk to who are here as our jobs to do this. All of the open door practitioners like me are mental health trained, and we're here for life happening while you're at university. And that could be anything. It doesn't need to be academic related or related to your research. Things happen while you're at university, life continues. We're here to talk about anything that's going on. There isn't anything that's too small. We're happy to take a bit more of a coaching approach if there's something where things are fine, but you'd like to be a bit better in some aspect of feeling a bit more comfortable with something, or you just want to talk to someone outside of the situation. That's what we're here for. Through to having big emotional reactions to things, struggling with things, through to having major crises. We, we see all of those. And that's what we're here for. You can get hold of an Open Door practitioner by finding Open Door and filling in our web form. This is confidential unless there's an emergency. And um, it's direct. We're pretty quick. So if you would like to talk any time between today and when you graduate, please do. We also have student wellbeing officers in most departments apart from the medical school. Um, we work together as a team, and the wellbeing officers, are, you'll see them more often because they're in the departments more. They're a first point of contact, someone to chat to, someone to have a quick word with, often to find out, well, what do you need next? They do a lot of, I just needed a quick chat, through to, oh, yeah, you want to have a chat with so-and-so in the admin team, or, oh, did you know that academic skills did this thing too, or have you tried this resource? Um, and we work together. If it turns out it's a bigger, more complex thing, we can happily pass you on. That's what we do. We're human beings. We're here to talk to. We sit down and have a chat. We can do that in a room. We can do that by Zoom. We can do that by phone, whatever you prefer. We're not medical. We're not going to do kind of diagnosis, medication, anything like that. So the other people we have edges with are the NHS, the National Health Service. I mention this because people come from different systems around the world, and in other places, if you want support with an emotional issue, it's a different person. So, and if you are living abroad, obviously you'll know your local system better than I will, so use that. If you're in the UK, the National Health Service is, and your general practitioner, your GP, and there is a practice called Unity that's based on campus, so there's others in the area. Um, they're the people to go to if you want a diagnosis for something, if you are already using medication and you're going to need more prescriptions or you think that might be a useful thing, or anything where it, you feel like a medical response would be useful. Other people we work with with Open Door are disability. Disability in this meaning is anything that's getting in the way of your student life, your life in general, that there's an extra barrier because of something that's ongoing longer term. So that could be a learning difference. It might be something like dyslexia. A lot of people sort of get 
find that they're somewhere on the autistic spectrum, which is a difference that has advantages, but also can be can also raise barriers, through to physical impairments, which could be an injury, it could be an ongoing thing, it could be an emotional thing, it could be a personality thing, a processing thing, whatever it is. If there's something that's bringing up, in some ways, an unfair extra barrier to you living your life here, then do send through some evidence of that to the disability team and they can talk about creating a student support plan which um, and that is an agreement with usually your department but with the university to say when this thing happens as either it all the time or sometimes happens here's what I need and we can pre-agree that so you don't have to have an exceptional circumstance when this happens that's what that's for um, the other thing I'll mention quickly, because there's a lot you're having mentioned to you today, is Talk Campus. Talk Campus is an online service. It's open to you. Um, the university has a subscription to it. That's available all the time, because we're here during the day, some evenings, um, but Talk Campus is there two in the morning, whenever and you can talk about how you're feeling about things, access other forms of support, access resources, so I'll mention that. And I'll hand back in a smooth fashion. <laughs> Thank you, Grant, that's great. So yeah, in terms of keeping yourselves happy and healthy, I can't stress enough how important it is to, to speak to others and connect with others as well. So just to um, raise your awareness, we will be really interested to hear from PGRs what they would like in terms of supporting and building communities. So we've put a link here to, if you would like um, to hear more and to have your say on what sort of networks and community building activities you would like, um, yeah, please sign up and we'll be in touch with, about that in due course. So yes, we hope you'll, you'll take part and you'll let us know how we can support you. So I'm really thrilled to um, be able to hand over for a bit to some of our current PGRs who are going to tell you a little bit about their experience and some advice they have for you around getting started with your PhD. So, um, I can see Felix on his way. <laughs> Felix and Catherine and Basil, ah, from the, from the skies. <laughs> cool. So, um, do you guys want to come and have a seat? And um, if you're happy to start, Catherine, I will hand the mic over to you. There you go. Okay. Um, are we sitting? Are we standing? Who knows? Um, this was an all sit. Okay. Um, yes, hello. Welcome to the University of York, or welcome back to those of you who are continuing or have done masters or undergraduates here. I'm Catherine Macy. I'm in the archaeology department, um, and my PhD is in autism in the Stone Age, or the Upper Paleolithic, for those of you who know your archaeological jargon. <laughs> um, so... I have always known that I wanted to do a PhD. I woke up from a nap at eight years old and went, I think I'll do a PhD. And my mother went, maybe see how things go first. Um, I've always been very lucky and privileged to be academically minded. Um, and I, I've been lucky enough that I've found the right funding and I'm here now. And I have 60,000 words to go. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, doing finding uh, out how PhDs worked um, was, was one of the biggest barriers to me because uh, when I was eight, the things I wanted to do was I wanted to do academia for the rest of my life and I wanted to travel. Um, and then I found out those things need money. Uh, I am a carer for my mother. Um, I come from a very disadvantaged economic background, even though I have a very nice voice. Um, and honestly, they've been the biggest barriers so far. But the University of York is incredibly supportive with that. Um, and to be honest with you, I've just been lucky. And something that I always say is, I've worked hard, I deserve to be here, but I've been lucky and that's why I'm here. Um, and something that I'm trying to do with this PhD is remind people that we shouldn't have to be lucky. If you work hard, you should be able to be here because we've probably got loads of other people that should be in this room right now but aren't. Um, but obviously, every one of you deserves to be here, so well done. <laughs> um, part of the challenge of researching autism is being autistic. 
Um, I'm the first person, I'm the fifth person to do my research, and I'm the first autistic person to be doing the research, um, which is comes with its own challenges, and I cannot um, compliment the disability department enough at the University of York. It's one of the reasons I came here for my undergrad, and it's definitely a huge contribution to why I've stayed. Um, and as you will have picked up, I've done all of my degrees here. Uh, I came to York, didn't really like the campus. Archaeology were like, you should come, we do a free lunch. And I was like, well, I'm never going to come here. May as well not pay for lunch. Three degrees later. Uh, so free lunch works for those of you who end up in academia working as departmental. Um, but York is a fantastic community. Um, the biggest piece of advice I would probably give is if you have come here from a master's undergrad um, and you have a social circle, don't be afraid to expand that social circle to be more PGR focused. Um, so I'm quite young. Archaeology has a lot of mature students. So when I'm teaching, half the time they're older than me, which can be a bit intimidating, especially when I look 12 and I once had to prove to a security person that I was, in fact, the teacher in the situation. Um, <laughs> but um, something that I think I wish I'd done, because I started in the pandemic, 2020, um, was acknowledge that undergraduate societies are great, and a lot of them are really welcoming to postgrads, but they stay 21 and you don't. <laughs> um, I am now 25, and whilst that is very young in the grand scheme of things, it's not 20 or 21. Um, so that is the first piece of advice from this rambling that you're gonna get. Um, and I think the second is you're gonna change over the course of a PhD. I think even more than I changed being 18 to 21 in my undergraduate. Um, first and foremost, I used to go running for my relaxation. Now I'm physically disabled. It hurts to run, so it's not very relaxing anymore. Um, and that's a very big change, and I really hope less of you have that change specifically, because it's not fun. Um, but things that I used to love, um, Scooby-Doo was always my go-to show. Um, I have really mature tastes. But then I realized that actually I was in burnout, and I was relying on cartoons that I knew and recognized, and things like this. And a PhD is actually a really good place to learn about yourself. Um, I'm actually a morning person. It just turns out I don't get enough sleep. <laughs> Little things like this. Um, I'm also, unlike Francina, I am not very good at habits. It's the probable ADHD with the autism where I love my habits, but I don't like doing them. <laughs> Um, what do you mean I need to eat breakfast every day and make it? And like, life is constant washing up, even when you're meant to be doing a PhD. <laughs> um, but finding what does work for you is really important. And I found that a PhD actually lets you explore that with a little bit more ease. So don't be afraid to try things out. Uh, my supervisor will go on to the more important stuff than just the life's a bit washing up sometimes and sometimes you go to the pub. Um, but my supervisor is amazing and one of the best things you can do is solidify a relationship with your supervisor. Um, mine, Penny Spikings, she is fantastic. She's won awards because she is fantastic. But she will say to me, if you're not in the right mindset, why would you do your PhD? I can take a week off and she's not going to have a go at me because she knows that if you're not mentally there, then the work you do is not going to be good enough. So why force yourself to do something when what you actually probably need to be doing is relaxing? Um, if you don't have a supervisor who is as phenomenal as Penny, um, you can't have her, she's mine, sorry. Um, don't be afraid to set boundaries because I've also worked with... Um, so she became really ill and I was being jumped around department um, supervisors. And some of them were very much like, well, no, you have to be doing this, you have to be doing that. And I was sort of like, no. If I just want to cry, my PhD is not going to be what it needs to be. And then I'm going to look back at something 
and go, hang on a minute, this is, and it's just gonna make it worse. Um, so setting boundaries, telling people, this is what I'm capable of right now, because you don't always have to give something 100%, because if you give something 60% for two days, that's 120%, but if you give it 100% one day and then couldn't do it the next day, that's less. I don't do maths, but I'm pretty sure that adds up. Um, yeah, I'm very much not a scientist. I'm doing with the statistics at the moment, and it's making me cry. Um, so yeah, a really good relationship with your supervisor is really important, but don't be afraid to control that relationship. Um, I get on really well with mine, and I know people who other people, it's purely professional. I, have, I do social things with mine, but it's okay to not do. I think people can be four types of people. There are people you'd go for a drink with, but wouldn't want to work with, and people you, and, and the, it's the category thing. Okay, moving on. <laughs> so yeah, um, I had something else. Oh yeah, and the other thing I think is, do the training sooner rather than later. Um, I have loved being a GTA. It's genuinely one of my favorite parts of my PhD so far. Um, the students are amazing. You talk to them one-to-one, -one, you get so much back. Seeing, seeing their little faces l realize something is the most rewarding thing in the world. So do the GTA training, consider trying to find time to teach, all of these things, um, and ultimately, you're all here, and you're all going to make an amazing difference. I know that my research is the cutting edge thing a PhD is meant to be, but I also know that reminding people out there who really don't like the fact they're autistic because they feel alone, and they've made that really social awkward like thing because they said something and no one laughed, or they're getting that like look that people share when I say something and I shouldn't have said that or I phrased it weirdly. And I'm going I'm reminding them that they belong. Um, yeah. So find something like that because it is hard, but nothing worth doing is easy, and a PhD is definitely worth doing. And I will now shut up. <laughs> I think I'm going to be less eloquent than that, I'm afraid. Um, hi, my name is Basil Price. Uh, I am a PhD candidate in the Center for Medieval Studies, so over in Kings Manor, near archaeology. We don't have free lunches. Um, and um, I actually handed in my thesis last week, uh, so thank you. Thank you. I hope that's how the examiners react to it. <laughs> uh, we'll see. Um, and I really only have kind of four major points to go over, and they are entitled Expectations, Opportunities, Communities, and Futures, um, which kind of relates to a lot of the things that you've probably already heard about in this induction. So you'll forgive me if I kind of repeat some of the things that you've already heard, but that just shows how important they are. Um, the big thing that I would say is kind of to Catherine's point is to know thyself. Know how you work. Know what works for you. Uh, I am a morning person. I also work on the weekends, and some PhD students find that horrifying. Why would you work on the weekend? Well, because I hate working past 4, 4 p.m., and I would rather have 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. to myself than work on the, week, uh, than work on the weekend. Working on the weekend's fine. Uh, so don't be pressured to work differently based upon the other people in your program. Work in the way that works for you, uh, and know what kinds of ways that you can safeguard your time. Um, and do safeguard your time. Do make time and schedule time for yourself. Um, until very recently, I just didn't work past 4 p.m. Uh, but now I'm on the job market, which means I am working every hour of my life. Uh, so don't do that. Make time for yourself. Um, and the other thing I would say is um, also about supervisors and supervisions, and this is about setting expectations. Uh, so some of you may be blessed to have a wonderful relationship with your supervisors. Others of you may not. That is the reality of these things, I think. I have a very good relationship with my supervisors, and it's a very professional relationship. Um, and a lot of that comes down to the kinds of conversations we had in the first month 
of my PhD about here's the times when we're going to meet. Here is what would work for me. Here is how you can best support me. And I think it's really important to have explicit conversations about, OK, for the first year of the PhD, we're going to meet every four weeks. For the first kind of chapter that I write, if you're doing a monograph-based PhD, which if you're in the humanities, you probably are, for those you might want to say, I'm going to meet with you every six weeks so I can get a large amount of writing done. But really set those expectations early on um, because you don't want to be in a situation where you haven't heard from your supervisor in months and you're waiting for them to call, they're waiting on you to call, and it's just awkward. Don't be in that situation. Um, yeah, it's, it's not fun. Um, the other thing I would say about this is, related to my know thyself point, is to know what your professional aims and goals are going in. Why are you getting a PhD? Like, think about that really seriously and think about why you're thinking about that in the way that you're thinking about it. Because that will shape how you design your PhD journey. Coming to the second point, opportunities. Make the most of it. Um, I know that this is something that has been said over and over and over again in this induction, is get involved in things at the university and within your wider academic community. So if there are conference papers that come up, apply to them. It doesn't matter if you don't get in. The worst thing that can happen is they say no and you don't have to write a paper. <laughs> Just start throwing ideas out there. Get your, get your feelings, your thoughts, your ideas out into the world because part of this is part of the PhD, I think, should be about sharing what you do with other people and Catherine kind of touched on that as well. Um, if there are things in your department that you think are really, really cool, get involved in them. Um, at uh, the Center for Medieval Studies, we have a Viking research group. I don't really work on Vikings, but I work on medieval Scandinavia, so I'm really interested in those kinds of things. Uh, and I get involved in those communities. Um, the other thing is, if things don't exist, make them. Um, so for example, I've been running for the past three years a um, critical theory for medievalists reading group, because I like critical theory, and I like medieval studies, and a lot of medievalists don't do critical theory, and I think that they should. So, and it was also an excuse for me to read fun things that were fun. So I set that up. Um, so feel free to set stuff up, and more often than not, the department will try to support you, um, because departments are very committed to helping PGRs develop their interests and also to build community. Which leads nicely into my third point, People, communities, uh, we've talked about this a lot. Um, we've talked about like finding a network of PGRs, building your network of non-PGR friends. I think it's really important to have a relationship with your department, particularly your administrators, because they are the first line of defense for opportunities for dealing with institutional bureaucracy. Make friends with your department administrators. They are good people who do a lot of work and they are underappreciated. Please appreciate them. Um, and it's really important for you to make friends with your cohort. I have a very, I think, I think it's really important that you have a professional relationship with your cohort. It's even better if you can have fr be friends with them. Um, you have to have a professional relationship with them even if you're, they're not your friends. <laughs> That's my hot take. Um, one of many, I'm sure. Uh, is that these are the people who are your allies. They're the people who are going to help you deal with teaching. They're the people who are going to help you deal with oh my goodness, there's this problem in our shared office. I don't know how to deal with it. Um, there are people who will become your friends. There are people who will be with you at conferences. And when you're feeling awkward because no one's talking to you, you can go bother the people from your institution. <laughs> it's never happened to me. I wouldn't know. Um, so like these are, it's really important to kind of build that network of friends, um, professional or otherwise. Um, the other thing, what was my fourth point? Futures. That's, the, that's an important one. Like I said, uh, kind of at the outset of the spiel, that it's really important to know what your professional goals are going into this, and they might change. Um, I think that's really important, is that we get kind of pigeonholed into a particular path where we have a particular idea about what the academy is going to be like, and it turns out that we are disappointed. And that's okay. Um, I think that's part of it. Um, and I think, particularly if you're in the humanities and you know what the kind of situation in the humanities is like, it's really important to take that seriously. I don't mean to be a downer, but you have to take it seriously. Um, I went into this, not maybe at eight, age eight, uh, but I went into this thinking definitely that I was going to be an academic, and I still have that idea, despite everything. Um, but I've designed my PhD very much to serve that purpose. 
So when you are embarking now on your PhD journey, it's really important to start thinking about how you can tailor your PhD to support your professional aims. So if you want to work in heritage, find ways to work in heritage during your PhD. If you want to work in journalism, find ways to get involved in journalism during your PhD. If you want to be an academic, the time to start thinking about publications is now, at least in the humanities. That's my kind of hot, another hot take. Um, so these are some of the things that I would start thinking about. Um, same thing with GTAing. GTAing, uh, graduate teaching assistants, is, assistantships are really, really useful uh, for kind of deciding whether or not the academy is for you. If you don't enjoy teaching, it's probably not. However, teaching is super rewarding, um, and it can be super rewarding. Uh, and so, so try to find opportunities for teaching that appeal to your particular set of interests. Um, and don't be afraid to ask your supervisors for help with that as well. Um, ask them for opportunities. They might have some suggestions about how to get involved. I think the biggest takeaway that I would give you um, is <laughs> know your limits, which I know sounds like a really strange thing to say. Um, as much as I'm saying to make the most of it and to do everything that you can, you need to be aware of not overcommitting. I had a very, very bad May. Um, where I had done the thing where I had thrown out a bunch of applications and unfortunately they had all been accepted, which mean, meant I had to write five papers in a month while finishing my thesis. Um, it was not a fun May. But that was because of a fear that I had that I wasn't going to be an academic, that I wasn't going to make it on the job market. So I think it's important to keep those things in mind while still being very realistic about what you can humanly accomplish. I think the other thing I would keep in mind is as you're thinking about your future, know what you can and can't do. So I'm obviously American. Um, I'm also trans. And going, the idea of going back to the States right now is very scary. And I had co previously come into this with the idea that I so wanted to be an academic that I could go anywhere. That reality has sort of shifted. But that's OK, because it's given me a better idea about what I can and can't do. So I hope that you all kind of internalize that or have that at the back of your mind, thinking about what you can and can't do, and doing all you can and not beating yourself up if you can't do more than that. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. In case you can't see the screen, my name's Felix. Um, I was trying to think why have they put me on this panel, but um, maybe it's a slightly different perspective. Um, I was sitting there four years ago, and uh, I also submitted last weekend, like Basil. So, <laughs> um, so you know, it, it, it is doable. Um, <laughs> I, um, when I think about my PhD, it's either a midlife crisis or the best 40th birthday present I could sort of think of. <laughs> um, I was a high school math teacher for about 14 years, so I hope that doesn't cause anyone any sort of, uh, you know, um, bad memories. But um, I'd always wanted to be a researcher, and yeah, I, I, I do feel very lucky. I, I, I do mean that it's like a present, because I've always wanted to learn more and to get stuck in. Um, I'm in computer science, uh, in, in AI, and I'm lucky that I've now got um, a research associate job, so I've got another year that I can sort of be gaining experience and still, still learning, still trying things out. Um, yeah, so what can, I, what can I tell you in terms of advice? I, everybody will talk to you about imposter syndrome at some point. Um, the last time I was at university was the year 2000 when I graduated from York, and then you know I joined a PhD program in 2019, having not done any proper academic stuff. Um, and as you might have heard, sort of AI moves along quite fast, so I genuinely have massive gaps. Um, so kind of picking up from some of what the other panelists have said, um, I was aware of this, but. I, I, rather than seeing it as a problem and looking across to everybody else who had all these up-to-date skills and they could do this that I couldn't do, um, it was just a great opportunity for me to, to just train, just to you know, um, sign up to courses and just say to my supervisor, I'm going to spend the next month just learning how to do this thing because I think it's needed for my research. And that was just brilliant. That's kind of what I was uh, longing to do. Um, maybe the other sort of perspective I can give um, ironically, I'm in constraints programming, and I, um, 
I have a family of, well, we have four kids, and we had a house fire, and we had COVID. So in terms of, you know, don't spend too long working on your PhD, there's a fat chance because <laughs> there's so much else to do, you know, between being technical support and shoulder to cry on and uh, dealing with all the admin that uh, an insurance claim throws at you. So it's kind of, in a way, it was a different thing. It was always feeling like I'm not quite doing enough and will I ever get there? And thankfully I have. Um, so uh, I also, I mean, Thinking back four years ago, I also threw myself into as much as I possibly could and I guess maybe one way to think of it is as a sort of as a slope or a curve, you know, at the beginning say yes to a lot of things and gradually learn when to say no um, and focus on I don't know, you know, writing up or whatever it is that you um, that you're sort of aiming for. Um, but just to give you a flavor of some of the stuff that I got involved in, I, I also GTA'd and that was a, a real joy. Um, I did something called the YPAD, which was if you do any kind of teaching like GTAing, you can sort of get accredited for it by doing a bit of reflection, writing a report, doing a little task, and that was a nice sort of professional little you know, thing on the CV and also a really pleasurable um, experience. Um, community sort of went out, out of the window, didn't it, in COVID, and that was really tough because I, I loved coming to the office, meeting other people, and then within six months that kind of went dead. So one of the things that I did was just set up a, a, a Discord server for the PGRs just to kind of have that incidental interaction and to help each other out. You know, how's your uh, interim report going? Um, just, just any old rubbish, you know, memes, whatever it is. And it built a small sense of community and we could still help each other out even though we weren't sitting in the same um, kind of office. And um, I won't Hopefully I won't bang on too long, but um, one last thing. We, we were asked, you know, if there was one thing you'd like to tell uh, yourself four years ago, let's say, uh, you know, one tip. Um, maybe, well, maybe I'll break it down to a couple of things. One is um, I, I'm not great at planning in a sense, and I'm also a bit of a perfectionist sometimes. So one really great thing is to sort of to commit to deadlines. So to promise something to your supervisor, Okay, it's not a hard deadline, but you lose face if you don't, if you don't uh, deliver. So then it forces you to actually get on and, and hand something over that's maybe good enough, even if it's not as good as you wanted it. Similar to you know, how Basil said about applying to conferences or entering competitions or whatever it is, if there's a deadline there, for me, that really helped. It might stress you out, but for me, that was really helpful. The other thing was I, um, you know, I said I had all these different commitments and limited time to spend on the PhD in a sense. And it also is related to you know, knowing, knowing yourself. Um, I, I think I have maybe two or three hours of peak me <laughs> where, I, where I'm good <laughs> and, and can think and can do things and I'm enthusiastic. And yeah, it's probably between sort of 8.30 and 11.30 and then my stomach takes over. But um, having a set of ongoing things you know, sort of streams that are open is really useful because sometimes you can't do work that needs inspiration or creativity. So there are always boring things to do, whether it's um, I don't know, experiments in my case, or just proofreading something, or organizing things, emails, whatever it is. So having sort of several things ongoing and being mindful like, okay, I'm going to just set this aside because I could spend three more hours and I won't really get anywhere and let's just get some of this stuff, stuff out of the way because the weekend won't be there for me to, to catch up, so I better get something useful done now, even if it's not the thing that's really kind of stressing me out. And also quite often in, I don't know what it's like in, in, in the humanities, but in the sort of math and computer science stuff, there can be a bug that you can stare at for a week and you're not getting anyone. If you just leave it for a couple of days, you come back and within minutes, you've kind of solved it. So yeah, just having that, you know, a set of things on the go um, to come back to. I probably had a bunch more planned that I can't remember now, but it has been brilliant. There is lots of support, so I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much. Um, I hope that all made sense. <laughs> I hope you made notes. Have you made notes? Um, thank you very much to our panel, and I would like to um, invite the remaining panel for the next 
session. So thank you very much to all of our PGRs and thank you for all the advice. As you remember, when you signed up, there was this lovely link to a Padlet that you could submit your question to be answered today. We've got some questions that have been submitted in advance. However, if you have an urgent question that you haven't submitted yet, there's this lovely little QR code that you can click on now and add your question to the Padlet and we will be prioritizing the questions that get the most of ticks. And we've got representatives from different support teams, from the wider university, and we can start with the questions that we already have. Yeah. Okay, so um, just before we get started with the questions, I'm going to pass the mic along the row, if that's okay. Um, so we've heard from Kate. Helen, I'll pass to you just to give a quick intro. In. Hi, my name is Helen Poyer. I'm the Student Administration Manager for the Postgraduate Research Team, and we're in the um, Central Student and Academic Services um, Department. So we are here to look after you, but your departmental graduate administrator is kind of your first port of call, and we're the ones you can come to next if you need to. Hi, I am Claire. Um, I absolutely hate speaking in public, so please forgive me. Um, I'm the Wentworth Graduate College Manager, so our role at the university is to foster that sense of community and provide uh, social and networking opportunities as well as um, activities that uh, enhance your known academic learning. So that's, that's Wentworth. Hi everyone, um, this is Martin. I'm president of GSA, uh, Postgraduate Student Union here. Um, this is also my new role. Uh, I'm really here to support all of our members. Um, I believe I've met many of you in the welcome talk and Jay's last, Jay's night last night. <laughs> I recognize some faces. Oh. Hi everyone. Great to see so many of you here. I'm Johnny, I'm the Chief Exec of the GSA, so I work with Marden here. Um, the GSA is a graduate students union. We represent you as PhD students. You are all members of the GSA. So we play a role in representing your voice to the university. Um, we also run events and activities throughout the year as well. And we offer an independent advice service so if you encounter any difficulties during your PhD and you want to get independent advice which is separate from the university, you can come and speak to us. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Tom Blake. I'm based in the Open Research team. We're based in the library. Uh, so we help with uh, library services that are specifically geared towards researchers and supporting you. Um, so I'm here today representing the Open Research team but also the library more generally. Hi, my name is Cecilia Lowe. I am the head of the learning enhancement team at the university. We're also part of the library, but we concentrate more on academic skills and digital skills. So I help with the teams that run the Math Skills Centre, the Academic Writing Centre. We run our academic skills workshop programme, our online guides and all our digital support, which you might not feel you need, but you do need. <laughs> the more digital skills you have these days, the better. So those are the teams that I work with. Hi everyone, I'm Helen Alchalik from the academic practice team. Um, our team deliver teacher training and development uh, to not only yourselves as GTAs, but to staff across the university. Um, I already recognize quite a few of you who've done your introduction to teaching and learning already. So I lead on that within the team, but we also have um, other schemes such as the YPAD scheme, which I think Basil or Felix mentioned, um, and other teaching development support. Uh, so if you want to talk about anything related to that, if you want to contact us, very pleased to hear how enthusiastic the previous PGRs were about teaching. So, yeah, thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Emma Barnes and I'm Head of Research and Faculty IT 
Um, we're based in IT services, but we're here to support your computational needs as researchers. So that could be an application on your desktop that you need for your research, all the way up to using some of our supercomputers and cloud technologies. Um, we offer help in terms of one-on-one -on -one support. So if you're a bit stuck on something, you can come and talk to us, all the way up to pointing you in the right direction in terms of where you want to go with your research. Okay, thank you so much for introducing yourselves. Hopefully that's already given you a really great flavor of what's on offer in terms of support for you guys. Um, we'd like to first of all um, open the floor to any questions that you might have here in the audience before we um, maybe address some of the questions that were pre-submitted. Does anybody have a question they'd like to start with? <laughs> okay, I'm not seeing any immediate hands. That's absolutely fine. You can still be thinking about any questions you might want to ask. Um, so I'll start with the first question we've got. Um, this is a, quite a general question, um, so I'll open it to, to a, anyone that might want to uh, contribute. But the first question was, um, how often should P PGRs be meeting with their supervisor? I, I can take that. So um, I'm going to be a true academic and say it depends. Um, so our bare minimum requirement is that you have a what we call a formal supervision meeting every six to seven weeks. So um, that's the one that you need to record on SkillsForge and that's really, really important if you are, particularly if you're a visa holder, we need to have that, but it's, it's, it's important for all of you. So that's a formal supervision and for some disciplines, um, that's the main supervision meeting um, and you, you might not have much contact with your supervisor between that. In other disciplines, so in the sciences, so I'm in um, um, environment and geography, um, I think a lot of you that are in um, disciplines like chemistry, where you're doing a lot of lab work, you might see your supervisor every day. Um, not for a supervision meeting, for a quick question. I meet my uh, PGRs generally um, every one to two weeks for, for an hour. So it, it, is, it is variable, um, and that takes different formats depending on your, your, um, your discipline, but a minimum of every six to seven weeks if you are full-time, and if you're half-time, 50%, obviously that's every um, 12 to 14 weeks. Oh, is it the same? Sorry, Helen's, Helen's reminded me. Even if you're part-time, sorry, it's every six to seven weeks. Um, I apologize, um, but yeah, just to clarify. So yeah, that's the, that's the minimum. That help. Great. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, so our next question relates to uh, working as a GTA. So um, maybe a few of these questions I'll kind of put to Helen in one. Um, so if people in the audience are interested in becoming a GTA, can you talk them through the process and what training and recognition is also available through becoming a GTA? Is that better? Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, so. Before you start teaching as a GTA, I think a lot of you already know, but you need to complete the introduction to teaching and learning. Uh, once you've completed that training, which you can find on the web page on the university with that title, once you've completed that, um, you can then look at applying for uh, teaching positions within the university. So either by looking on the teaching opportunities page on the YGRS page or Handshake or via your departments, your GTA coordinators. Um, just to uh, give a little bit more detail about the training, it's uh, a self-study component four hours and then a two-hour workshop. So you complete the self-study and then you attend the workshop. When you've done all of that, which takes approximately six hours, then you'll get credit on SkillsForge, which is your confirmation um, of uh, completion of the training. Um, just trying to remember, Francina, was there anything else particular that you were going to, that you mentioned? Was it... Um, applying for teaching. Yep, so um, applying for training. teaching. Um, who's the best person to contact? So I think you mentioned finding that through the YGRS webpage. Mm. Um, for, for teaching opportunities, yes. Yeah. So we, we in academic practice deal with the training and the YGRS teaching opportunities are for um, if you want to look for work. Yep. 
Yep, and the other part of the question was around the qualification and recognition. Right, okay. So um, we also, uh, I can't remember if it was Basil or Phoenix, Felix, um, but we also run the YPAD scheme. So if you decide you'd like professional accreditation as a teacher in higher education, you can uh, apply through academic practice to do the YPAD scheme. It stands for York Professional and Academ Academic Development. Um, going through this scheme, if you successfully complete it, will then give you Associate Fellowship of Advance HE, which used to be called the Higher Education Academy. Um, it takes about 12 months to complete the scheme. It's not very onerous, I'm sure you would agree. It's, yes, he's, he's nodding. Um, so it's something that would sit quite nicely alongside everything else you're doing without being really, really taxing. Um, it, and it does involve uh, some meetings, conducting a small piece of action research into teaching and then submitting an application. Another route to professional uh, accreditation is the YALTA scheme. Uh, it's currently full for this year, so I don't want to talk too much about that, but it's the York Learning and Teaching Award. That's a, a taught postgraduate module about uh, teaching in HE. HE. Um, so that's another possibility, and that also leads to the same accreditation. Is that Brilliant. everything? Thank you. Yes, yeah, Cecilia, do you want to add? Yeah. Uh, just to add something, if you don't see many opportunities for teaching in your department, don't give up, because certainly within the Writing Centre, the Math Skills Centre, and the Statistics Centre, we work with a lot of GTAs. So keep an eye open, and we do uh, advertise via the graduate school uh, website. So keep an eye out if you would like to be a stats tutor or a writing tutor. There are other opportunities beyond your department. Actually, Cecilia, can I stay with you if that's okay? Um, would you be able to, uh, one of the questions we received was, um, where can I find, um, or what support would be best to improve my written academic English skills? Uh, okay, there's a range of support available for academic writing skills. Um, for many uh, PGR students, you are facing this <laughs> huge, apparently, mountain of a thesis that you have to write, that you're aiming to produce. It may seem like a mountain, but it's why it's a mountain that we've worked with students before through, as, as have your department, so don't be too afraid of it. But there's a lot of support available. Online, we have our skills guides, which are open to the public. So if you look on the University of York website and put in skills guides, there is a mass of online advice there. So you can find advice and guidance, even if it's 3 a.m. in the morning and you're in the middle of France, you can still find support about writing about dissertations and theses. There are also workshops that we offer about academic writing throughout the year. So the support we offer goes through the semesters, through the holidays. We never, we never leave you alone, basically. <laughs> Unlike other people who may disappear at certain times in the year, we don't. The workshops go on and everything else does as well. We also have a, an academic writing center which offers specific appointments just for PGR students mainly because we know that there can be quite a lot of writing that you have quite complex concerns sometimes about writing and language and appropriate, uh, the appropriate way to write in your thesis. So we have dedicated spots for you every week throughout the year in the writing center. And there you can make an appointment to speak to someone for half an hour about your writing. And you can do that frequently through the year if you need to, but we're hoping that after a couple of discussions, you don't need to come and see us anymore, that you're fine. And if there are still anxieties or worries, not specifically just about writing, but about study in general, we also have study coaching appointments where you can book time for half an hour to talk to someone just about something you're worried about related to your studies. So there's lots of support. And the links are in the, in the slides that you'll be provided with. Thank you, that's great. So um, we're aware we're coming to the end of our, our um, allotted time, but we might just ask one or two final questions, if you can bear with us. Um, the coffee and the cake will be ready for, for us all very, very soon. Um, so what I'd like to do is ask um, 
our colleagues from the Graduate Student Association. Um, could you give us, um, some of our PGR speakers mentioned this kind of uh, wanting, yeah, anything spe specialist for um, postgraduate researchers. Uh, so could you tell us anything about any events or uh, societies or, or opportunities that there might be specifically for PGRs? Yep, of course. So um, <clears throat> what we'll say is there's, there's a range of activities available for, through both student unions for all students, but there are, are also some specialist areas. So one of the things we offer specifically in the GSA is we've got a PhD students network, which we would encourage you to sign up to. Uh, that's a social network where you can meet students from other disciplines. Um, and you can um, socialise, um, and I guess, you know, if you want to network as well, it's a good opportunity to, to meet other PhD students. Um, we are also um, looking out for students to get involved in helping to run the GSA. So we are a member-led organisation, and that means that we've got officers who have leadership positions within the GSA. So we're actually currently recruiting for part-time officers, uh, we're currently looking for a PhD student to, to attend Senate to represent PH the PhD student voice at sort of the highest level in the university. Um, and we're looking, we've got other voluntary positions as well, which we're really, really keen to get PhD students involved in. Um, you should have all received a newsletter from us yesterday, so I'd strongly encourage you to, to look at that newsletter. Um, we're also on the hunt for trustees to help with the governance of the GSA. That's another opportunity we're looking for. So what I would say is we've, we've got these leadership opportunities within the GSA. We've got some PhD specific social spaces, but then all of our other events and activities, virtually all of them I think are open to any PhD student, any postgraduate student, and we would encourage you to get involved. Thank you, that's great. And on that topic, um, Claire, is there anything you want to add in terms of college support for PGRs? Um, hi. So, yeah, there's loads of things going on in colleges. Um, you'll all be a member of a college. Don't worry too much about that, though, because as long as you're a postgrad, you're welcome to Wentworth. Um, as I mentioned, we've got lots of social and networking opportunities. We do have the ERF, the Early Researchers Forum, which is kind of like a peer group for, for early careers researchers like yourself, uh, postdocs, etc. And we do networking events for that. And also uh, we get guest speakers in. There's lots of guest lectures on a variety of different topics. And it's always nice to, to learn new things about things that are not related to your PhD. Um, we've got postgraduate social spaces at Wentworth as well. And for any of you who are commuting, there's lockers and free tea and coffee and lots of things. People tend to just hang out in Wentworth and study and read and, and chat, which is quite nice if they're not getting involved in any of the, the activities. So, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. One final question, I promise, and then there will be time for coffee and cake. Um, Tom and Emma. Would you be able to give us a sense of what your top tip would be in terms of getting started with open research and, respectively, research computing, if that is, in fact, what, uh, yeah, what you need to get started with your research degree? Um, Emma, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so I think initially, um, so we see a lot of people who want to learn programming, want to learn new skills. Don't be scared. Um, we're used to getting people who are quite new at some of these areas and the university is a perfect place to, to do this sort of learning and apply it to your research. Um, we have a number of uh, pages on the website and a wiki page which has links to various sort of programs, um, links to courses and things you, which can help you get versed in a variety of topics, whether it's programming, whether it's how to use things like Git and other tools, um, all the way to maybe it's using cloud and things like that. And worst comes to worst, just talk to us and, and we can direct you and support you in whatever you need. Brilliant, thanks. And Tom? Yeah, um, so open research, I'm conscious many of you may not necessarily know what open research is, but it, it's really a whole set of uh, kind of principles um, or ways of approaching research that are all based around the idea of sharing and openness and how that can be used really to improve both the integrity but also the visibility of your research. So that can be anything through to managing your research data. So from the start when you start to capture data, thinking about how you 
capture it and store it and organize it towards the end of your project? How do you share that data with other people? It could be to do with um, when you get, come to getting published, we can help on things around uh, sort of looking for how to get published, venues to get published in, particularly around kind of open access and openness to publishing. We can help with things like copyright and licensing um, for you as a researcher and all sorts of other areas um, for research. As a PGR, you can, um, you can come to our web pages, you can find out um, both just if you're interested in these principles, want to find out more, you can do that. If you have really specific questions, you can come to us, we can help with that. Or if you're really engaged, if you want to be a, an advocate for open practices within your department, we can support you and help you to do that as well. Um, so the one top tip I think would be um, visit our web pages, the link's on the, um, on the slide there. Um, in particular, if there's one thing to click on, we've got um, a guide, which is uh, called an open research, um, so the open research framework, and that gives a really good introduction to open research, what it is, why you do it, what's involved in the different principles, and it will also link to all the different training and things like that that we do. And if that's not enough for you, um, you can also book a one-to-one -one appointment with the team and come and talk to one of us, so there we go. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, so if you would like to join us for coffee and cake, we'd love it and our colleagues will be joining us. So if there's been anything that you've wanted to ask that you've not had the chance or maybe not been able to pop your hand up to ask, um, yeah, please stick around and, and, and ask them. They're all very approachable and happy to answer your questions. Um, in addition, we'll be adding some answers to the Padlet as well. So if there was anything on there that you wanted to add, we will make sure that all the answers will be available for you to access after today's event. That just leaves me to say a huge thank you for everyone that's contributed to today's induction event. Please do join us for cake, for coffee, and there's a goodie bag in the form of a plant for you all to take home. So please pick one of those up on your way.